Well, he got their freedoms, but not always they're poor, not always they're wretched, not always they're hungry. They got him in the end instead. That is very similar to the trade-off in China, with one fundamental difference. In Tunisia, the story about the standard of living being close to Belgium's turned out to be a fable. If in China they have the Communist Party, but also cash and increasing hope, the Tunisians under Ben Ali had crippling unemployment, crushing poverty in parts of the country, and an entire political edifice built on corruption and nepotism. Ben Ali, the Tunisians decided, had finally to be Twitter and Facebook, and he was. <laughs> History must have a wicked sense of irony. In 2003, the Bush administration, with 9-11 in the background, used powerful military tools to get rid of a dictator in Iraq called Saddam Hussein. But that happened at a very high cost in lives, material treasure, and political capital for both America and Iraq, although we don't know yet the final outcome in Iraq. In 2010, 2011, millions of young Arabs in places such as Tunisia and Egypt used American invented tools to organize themselves after the results of a decades-old struggle against those regimes became ripe for the picking. There are two notable ironies here, one actual and one potential. The potential irony would be if the United States somehow failed to get plugged into the Arab people's real desire for peaceful and real change. But the more wicked irony of the two must be the real one. Both Mubarak and Bin Ali had worked hard to connect Egyptians and Tunisians to the internet, but it was the internet that finally got both of them. The moral of the story is that mankind's potential for controlling his own destiny cannot always be foreseen or counted. Both dictators have tried to closely watch how the young of their respective countries interacted with each other and with the outside world, but both clearly failed. During the events in Cairo's Tahrir Square, if you had typed the word Egypt into the computer in China, Chinese big brother told you, you're going to get nothing. Because the Chinese government didn't want the Chinese people to know about what was going on in Egypt. So allow me to say a few things about China, since that's where I started. Enough coffee? <laughs> the Chinese are an ancient nation, like the Egyptians, the Iraqis, the Syrians, and many, other, uh, many others in the Muslim world. They will increasingly be part of a basket of major partners in that part of the globe. They already have substantial oil interests in Sudan and Iran, to mention but two places. They are also busy politically adjusting their foreign policy to their interests in the region. In the past, they were clearly and unabashedly pro-Palestinian, for example. Today, they are much more nuanced towards the Israelis and the Palestinians. That shows their ability to devise adjustable policies. One of the areas where the United States can continue to have the edge, if it wanted to, is in the area of democracy. People in the region can disagree about America's democratic intentions and credentials in North Africa and the Middle East. Americans can, Americans can disagree about whether supporting democracy in Libya, for example, is an American interest national, strategic, or otherwise. Fact is, Americans have nurtured a democratic capital over the centuries, while the Chinese simply have not. In addition to economic capital, the Arabs today need democratic capital. The United States can provide it or not. China simply cannot provide it, even if it wanted to. You cannot give what you do not have. I was in a former communist country, Hungary, just a few weeks ago, looking for similarities and differences between what happened in Eastern and Central Europe with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989 and what is currently happening in the Middle East and North Africa. Serendipity, again, served me well as I came across reflections on the subject by American billionaire George Soros, a native of Hungary, 
agree with him, we disagree with him, this is what he says. Reflecting on the Arab Revolution, Soros says, one very important factor is that people were willing to sacrifice their lives for a common cause. That is a memory, a historic event that will change those countries forever. It is irreversible. Revolutions are rarely successful, he says. They often end in tragedy, but they change the behavior of the country afterward. The 1956 Hungarian Revolution was repressed, but it carried within it the seeds of the successful revolution of 1989. Can the Arab world survive slumbering back into voicelessness and big brotherhood for another 40 years? I never say never, but it may be Maybe it may, be, it may be forced to, but I also have a strong sense that trying to turn back time is like patching up a crumbling house. At some point, the owner of the house will just have to accept the forces of nature and rebuild the house or risk being buried under its rubble. Whether you are Arab or American, watch the outcome of Syria's protests and of the new tug of war between the youth of Egypt and its Supreme Council of the Armed Forces in the run-up to the parliamentary and presidential elections in a few weeks. A good outcome in both places could change the Arab world and its relations with the rest of the world, including and especially this amazingly fascinating country, the United States of America. May Americans and Muslims always remember that a Muslim country the country of my birth, Morocco, that was first to recognize America's freedom from the shackles of tyranny. May Americans and Muslims always remember that they are much better off in friendship than in enmity, and that they have much to be friends about. May they remember that politics and politicians come and go, but that the spirit of friendship among people is much more durable. May Arabs and Americans always teach their children how to read and write, not just the alphabet, but also the march of history. May Arabs, Arab and American mothers always teach their children to dream of wonderful things and wonderful places. May Arab and American children always learn from their siblings how to conquer solitude as they take roads less traveled by towards each other in mutual peace respect and dignity. I am humbled by the invite to speak at the General Knox Museum. Thank you all very much for having me.